everyone. I welcome you to the CEC lecture series. I am Nupur Chavla, teaching English literature at Maitri College, Delhi University. And today's lecture is part of the ongoing series where we have been discussing different essays uh, which are related to the theoretical school that is feminism. And uh, in discussion today is uh, a book by another very seminal feminist, Italian feminist, Luisa Moraro, and the book is titled The Symbolic Order of the Mother. Now, if we uh, uh, talk about Luisa Moraro, she was uh, born in 1940. Uh, she's an Italian philosopher, writer, and academician. Uh, as I just now mentioned, she's also a feminist, and her theoretical ideas are linked to the second wave feminism that flourished around the late 60s in uh, Europe and the US and uh, the, the, the thrust of second wave feminism was uh, you know, to rally for civil and political rights of women. As you must already know that uh, you know, feminism had different waves, the first wave, the second wave, the third wave and uh, these waves as they are called are differentiated on account of uh, you know, different questions vis-a-vis -vis women that were taken up and uh, you know, uh, they were uh, sought to be uh, addressed uh, by uh, different thinkers and uh, even policy makers for that matter. So second wave feminism which was uh, you know, popular around the late 60s uh, talked about the civil and political rights of women. So, if in the first wave, uh, you know, the basic question of, uh, you know, women's uh, very essential fundamental rights was taken care of, in the second wave, it's the civil and the political rights that became important, right? And this was the time when even uh, Luisa Moraro was writing. Now, it's also important for us to um, uh, understand that, uh, you know, Moraro, uh, being an Italian, uh, was also very heavily influenced, or in fact is heavily influenced, by Belgian feminist, again, another very popular name in feminism, Luce Irigaray. And she's also translated many works of uh, Irigaray. So you will notice when you read, uh, you know, texts by Moraro, uh, you, you notice that she engages with Irigaray's arguments a lot, uh, sometimes accepting them, at times even, uh, you know, questioning them. But this kind of a constant interaction is, uh, you know, uh, quite a seminal uh, presence in Muraro's texts. Now, if we see the timeline of uh, Luisa Muraro, she actually started writing uh, somewhere around the 70s. And uh, she's been very prolific. She's written several books and essays. Now, one of her first book was uh, titled The Lady of the Game, Episodes from the Witch Hunt, which was written in 1976. Now, this was, uh, you know, uh, one of her uh, initial books um, that she wrote. But today, now, of course, apart from this, there are, there are several other books that she wrote. But in discussion today is a chapter from her 1991 book, which is titled The Symbolic Order of the Mother. Now, when you look at the title, uh, symbolic order of the mother, uh, you might think that what do we mean by the term symbolic order, right? Uh, now, this term itself establishes that how, um, you know, unlike most other theorists, you will notice that Luisa Moraro engages with uh, the question of, um, you know, uh, women and their uh, uh, place in society a little philosophically, right? Now, when I say philosophically, uh, I mean that she does talk about the idea of culture and politics, but she um, uh, also touches upon the discipline of philosophy and uh, notices that how uh, philosophy uh, and culture, uh, you know, together uh, also in a way uh, served to, uh, you know, kind of further discursively uh, this kind of a subjugation of women. Now, how that happens is something that we will discuss at length when we talk about her text. But broadly speaking, in this book, Luisa Muraro actually identifies the bond between the mother and the child as fundamental to the development of culture and politics. So she says that the equation, the, uh, uh, the bond, the relationship that a mother and a child share, this is 
uh, you know kind of very very significant to the development of culture and politics. Now you might wonder that how does you know bond between mother and child become a political question. Uh, as we discuss her text you will uh, notice what she means by this. Right? And therefore she says that you know thinking about this uh, relationship between the mother and the child then can become very very important in achieving truly emancipatory political change. So that is her point of engagement and, and, and that is why she refers to this as a symbolic order of the mother. So for her the mother figure is important and uh, you know when approached uh, 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 philosophically when also approached little theoretically uh, one tends to understand that how uh, examining the role of the mother, the equation of her with the child, uh, the way she is conceptualized in culture and philosophy, how that helps us uh, you know kind of frame uh, uh, you know uh, the, the kind of treatment that is meted out to women in society. Now the other uh, 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 you know uh, 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 kind of uh, emphasis that we notice in this uh, text by Muraro is that where she says that um, you know again talking about um, the mother and the child she says that uh, bodily development and language acquisition these two important uh, you know kind of uh, uh, landmarks in an, in an individual's life begin in this relationship between the mother and the child right of course so a child uh, you know is, uh, uh, is is conceived in a mother's womb develops over there and um, even you know the first language that a child acquires or in fact an, an infant acquires is the language spoken by the mother. So even before the child comes into this world uh, he or she is already uh, you know learning the language that the mother is speaking. So that is what Muraro says that you know bodily development and language acquisition both these being important parameters are very closely linked to this uh, relationship between the mother and the child. Now here you know talking in this context she says while this uh, relationship is so significant she says that philosophy has been dominated on the contrary by men right and in this book she recalls her quest for philosophy and uh, her desire for independence uh, and that desire for independence she says opposed her to her mother. Now what is, uh, 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 what is she trying to say here? She is basically indicating that how you know in philosophy or the philosophical thought has been uh, dominated by men. We have seen men come up with philosophical thought or men uh, you know uh, kind of uh, make philosophical thought or construct philosophical thought. So then she says that when she once uh, you know was grappling with philosophy, was dealing with the discipline, uh, at the same time in her there was this, in, uh, this desire for independence, right? But she uh, you know notices that her desire for independence was somewhat coexisting with a desire to go against her mother. So, this is something that she finds a little disconcerting that why did she have this intuitive understanding that only by means of dissociating from her mother can she acquire independence, right? Does this uh, uh, you know uh, discipline of philosophy that she was studying which was dominated by men does this play uh, uh, you know any role in this kind of a intuitive desire that she has. So these are some of the questions uh, you know that she uh, uh, takes up in this book and we also see that you know uh, in the book she uh, 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 discusses this conflict between philosophy and culture on the one hand and the relationship with the mother on the other uh, constitutes the root of patriarchy's symbolic disorder which blocks women's and men's access to genuine freedom. So she is actually talking about these two axes. First she talks about this conflict between philosophy and culture, 
right? Um, whereby, uh, you know, philosophy seems to be a domain uh, dominated by men and uh, culture then uh, had at its center the presence of the mother or the woman. Now, how do these two opposite domains uh, or these two opposite axes, uh, you know, be uh, converged? And on the other hand, is this, uh, you know, question of the child's relationship with the mother. So, these two uh, become, uh, you know, the central questions that she discusses uh, in her text that is the symbolic order of the mother. Now, today uh, in particular, of course, because it's a, it's a, a, a long book. So, for today's discussion, we have taken up two chapters. That is, the first chapter which is titled The Difficulty of Beginning and the other chapter of the book is The Word, A Gift from the Mother. Now, the word beginning, the difficulty of beginning over here points towards the fact that, you know, beginning of what, one might wonder. So, here in the text, she is actually talking about that how you know, the word beginning actually acquires multiple, uh, you know, meanings uh, in her book or particularly in this chapter. So, uh, at the outset, uh, you know, the word beginning uh, means that, you know, she is uh, sitting down to write and she is uh, unable to find a perfect place to begin, all right, or a perfect point to begin uh, writing. So, now this idea of or this difficulty of beginning as she says, then takes her to philosophy. She thinks that she might get an answer about this question of beginning, uh, you know, uh, from philosophy and from there she thinks about the idea of beginning vis-a-vis -vis her own self, that is her own beginning as an individual, which then is connected, deeply connected with her mother, right? So, we see that how this question of beginning acquires multiple connotations in her chapter. Now, the next chapter which is titled The Word, A Gift from the Mother, again, I would like to draw your attention to the title. Uh, it's uh, Now, the title, uh, it says that the word which is a gift from the mother, right? So, uh, this uh, uh, brings to mind something that, that we were discussing just a while ago that how a child's first contact with language is in the mother's womb, right? So, that's why Muraro says that the word, the spoken word or language is almost like a gift from the mother to the child because even before the child uh, comes into this world, enters the world of culture and exchange and understanding, even before he comes into being, one can say, uh, you know, in the in the material sense of the word. Um, yet, he has already started to acquire language through the mother. So, these interesting concepts, uh, you know, uh, Luisa Muraro charts and she discusses that, uh, you know, how uh, talking about the question of uh, motherhood, talking about the question of uh, philosophy, talking about uh, all these uh, issues uh, in the context of uh, culture as well, how it helps us chart different attitudes that have existed towards women and mother in particular and how then by extension those attitudes help us understand the larger patterns of discrimination, subjugation that are uh, you know encoded in these ideas. Right? So, that is broadly the conceptual framework that she, uh, you know, charts uh, in the two chapters. Now, uh, in the first chapter, she uh, very explicitly states that the theme of her book is politics of women. All right? Now, Muraro gives a very specific meaning to this rather broad term. Now, we know that how politics of women is a very broad term, but she examines how exactly are the discursive practices in culture and philosophy, how they frame subordination of women. So, it is this part of the politics vis-a-vis -vis women that she engages with. Now, what do we mean by discursive practices in culture and philosophy? We mean that, I mean, uh, uh, this, uh, this actually means that, you know, how different ideas, um, uh, different, uh, you know, uh, sets of beliefs and values which are, uh, uh, you know, introduced uh, through different means of culture and through different philosophical schools of thought, 
how these practices then, the way they are framed, the way they are uh, formulated, how both these lead to some kind of a subordination of women. Now, you might wonder how. Now, you see, any kind of subordination definitely is, um, you know, uh, seen very clearly in action. But before it comes into action, it is it, it exists in the form of ideas. And this is what uh, Muraro engages in, that how philosophy and culture, uh, you know, further such ideas, how they shape such attitudes, which then ultimately convert into actions of subordination of women, right? Now, uh, with respect to this, she very clearly states in the book, and I'll quote, she says, what I know instead is the theme. So now, theme of what? Theme of a book. The politics of women. I began writing the very moment I realized how philosophy had trapped me, unquote. Now, what is, uh, what is she trying to say here? Two things. First, she says that my theme in the book will be politics of women. And second, she says that I started to think about this question of politics of women the moment I felt somewhat trapped in philosophy. Now, what is this? I mean, what does she mean by being trapped in philosophy? Now, she discusses in the book that how, you know, she was interested in philosophy at a time and she, was, uh, she would uh, try to read different philosophers. But she made some observations that how those philosophers were male-centric in their view, uh, they somewhat, uh, you know, obscured the influence of the women in life. They did not talk about the contribution of women. And all that they focused on was a male-centered perspective, right? And uh, she said that this kind of a discipline then did not give her the answers that she was looking for. Now, what was the answer that she was looking for? Remember, we talked about the answer about beginning, how to begin a text, about the beginning about her own self, right? These questions, she thought she might be able to, uh, you know, uh, get the answers to these in philosophy. But unfortunately, she says that philosophy felt short and she felt trapped. And that is when she felt that there is a need to go beyond philosophy. Philosophy, which has been, uh, you know, uh, uh, predominantly, uh, uh, you know, kind of under the control of men. So from here then, she says, came her theme, that is the politics of women, right? Now, we also notice that, um, uh, you know, there was something about the reality that made her think of independence, that made her think of freedom. And therefore, this entire search for, as she calls it, the beginning, right? And she says uh, uh, in her book, and I quote, she says, I was looking for symbolic independence from the given reality, unquote. So very clearly, what do we see? We see an assertion of a woman who was looking for some kind of an independence, some kind of a freedom, from the given state of affairs. Now, what were these given state of affairs? She discusses that these given state of affairs were those, uh, you know, uh, whereby, um, you know, uh, conceptions and culture and philosophy were heavily tilted towards men uh, and they did not at all factor in the uh, woman's uh, uh, predicament, did not factor in the woman's contribution to the development of any kind of thought, right? So these uh, condition, uh, uh, these conditions broadly made her, uh, you know, uh, want to seek independence, and thereby her search for, as she calls the beginning, right? Now she uh, further, you know, elaborating upon the idea of beginning, she says, and I'll quote: She says, "I wanted to get to the beginning of things in order to understand." and to understand myself and to do so I went against my mother." Unquote. Now here she you know kind of describes a, a kind of a paradox. She says that um, you know I was trying to understand how to begin writing. I was trying to understand 
about the beginnings of my own self. I wanted to be free from the given reality. So she says that while I was, uh, you know, kind of grappling with all these questions, I intuitively, automatically went against my mother. Went against my mother meaning what? She felt that it is only when she dissociates from her mother that she will genuinely attain the freedom or independence or that selfhood that she has been looking for, right? Now, this is quite, um, uh, you know, ironic. Why? Because this intuitive desire to dissociate from her mother, uh, you know, uh, which then seems to be synonymous to freedom, where does this come from, right? This is the question that seems to be the subtext of her, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, writing uh, over here. Why does she think that she has to dissociate from her mother uh, to get freedom, to get that sense of selfhood, right? Further engaging with this question, uh, she, uh, you know, uh, uh, looks at uh, uh, philosophy and she uh, looks at the problematic position of the mother. So, how philosophy and culture then, uh, you know, somewhat, uh, uh, you know, kind of um, added to this intuitive desire in her to go against her mother. Now, how does philosophy uh, and, 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 and culture, how do these two disciplines, uh, you know, contribute to this intuitive desire to dissociate from the mother? That's something that we will discuss, uh, you know, when we uh, go to uh, the other parts of her um, uh, book. Uh, but for now, if we very quickly look at the major points that we've discussed so far in this lecture, we've seen that how uh, Luisa Moraro is an Italian feminist who was born in 1940, is still around and she uh, uh, is associated with the second wave feminism. Uh, the book that we are discussing today, uh, at least the, uh, some of the chapters from the book is titled The Symbolic Order of the Mother and here she discusses, uh, you know, she says that the primary theme is the politics of women and over here, uh, uh, you know, the term uh, politics is uh, uh, acquires a, uh, a peculiar meaning where uh, she uh, you know examines how do di how different discursive practices in culture and philosophy they come together to frame some kind of a subordination of um, a women right next we said that she also uh, deals with uh, uh, you know the problematic uh, aspect of uh, philosophy how it has always been uh, male dominated, it has been, uh, you know, kind of uh, always restricted with a, a, a to a uh, to a certain kind of a male centered view, which uh, ignored the presence of the woman or the mother, and this is something which you know uh, discomforts her. Then third, we said that she uh, is looking at the idea of beginning, right? That how to begin writing, uh, the beginning of her own self. And this takes her to the question of philosophy. This makes her think about the position of mother, the role of the mother. And third, we said that how she's, uh, she, uh, she says that she is seeking some kind of an independence. And that independence she views in terms of dissociation with the mother. Right? So, these ideas then tell us that how she is, uh, you know, engaging with the question of, uh, um, uh, with, the, with the problematic aspect of culture and philosophy and how these two uh, configure the figure of the mother. So, what is the problematic? That is something that we will discuss still further in the coming lecture. Thank you.